So, uh, I'm up through the great hunt. Uh, I, feel, I feel like I'm, I can do this, this panel. Uh, uh, yeah, if you, if, you, if you don't know, I wrote a book called Origins of Little Time. Uh, that, uh, that goes through, uh, thank you. Uh, goes through some things that are kind of important to us. Uh, I assume while I'm here, uh, but I'm also a, uh, a military analyst, conflict analyst. Uh, I do a lot of work in ancient and medieval warfare, mostly finding, uh, re locating and reconstructing battlefields. So that's spare time stuff. Um, my name is Ali Shields. I am the co-host of the podcast Real Takes. Uh, the first time, thank you. Uh, the first time reading a podcast um, that also analyzes the TV show through the lens of um, screenwriting and screenwriting craft. I'm uh, also a screenwriter. Um, my most recent projects um, are for Nickelodeon. Um, and uh, I'm also the co-host of the podcast Hot Nuance Podcast, which is uh, talking about the Alana series right now, which is pretty fun. I am Guy. Uh, I play Uno. I'm a long time New York Times fan. I read the books a couple times before the TV show was even announced. So I'm super psyched that Amazon has let me out and that I can be here with all of you. Very nice. I am James Stark. I'm the real time track director. Um, and I'm really here just to facilitate the discussion between these three experts because. Well, we hope they're experts. <laughs> I'm, sure about, I'm sure about this one. Um, so first, let's go over some of the challenges in adapting something that's as massive as the Wheel of Time. Um, Ali, I know you had a few points, and we'll get to everybody else as well, but uh, just a few? Just a few. Always, always just a few points. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, one of the things that is the most important about um, an adaptation, especially at this scale, to remember is that we're condensing a massive amount of books uh, down to you know eight episodes of you know potentially eight seasons. I think is what they yeah. said they wanted to do. So that's going to require a lot of smart real estate. Basically, things have to do. Uh, more than one thing if they're going to make it onto screen or we have to start combining moments to make them really impactful. Mm -hmm. um, budgetary restraints are always a big deal. So every location that's used, every set that's used, you know, it's not just coming out of the writer's imagination. It's got to be realized. Um, that's going to cost a lot of money. Every member of the cast and crew is going to cost money. You're essentially kind of right, running a company, a temporary company mm -hmm. for a period of time as uh, people in charge. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, money, budgetary restraints, and then also we're not just, you're not just adapting for uh, the existing audience, but for people like my mom who watched the first episode and thought Layla was the Dragon Reborn. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And was very shocked <laughs> that they killed her. <laughs> hey, spoiler level. No. Spoilers <laughs> for the first episode. Like, for the first time, you're saying that. Um, yeah. So, does anyone else have any points about like just the challenges? Because for me, I can't even imagine. Um, all I'll say is I, I've been privy to a few of the discussions on the other side, and I just want to clearly say from the beginning, I am 100% Team Rafe. I think the things, the challenges Rafe has had to deal with are extraordinary. And I know there's so much thought and care, consultations with the estate, you know, of course, Sarah Nakamura's there, and the writers love Wheel of Time. And all of them, Rafe has a huge place in his heart for it because of his relationship with his mom, you know, and Justine and AK and everyone, Dave, I mean, so, I think any change that is made is not made without deep consideration and literally in some cases years of discussion and back and forth. So uh, it's really easy, just like when you're watching a, a game or something to think, oh, why'd they call that play? Uh, it's obvious the quarterback should have done whatever, you know. But when you're in on the inside, there's just so much more. And that's, I guess, the one thing that I wish the, the fans could really know and believe how much the team loves the show. And they, they love the books. And any change that is made is really being made 
for the good of the entire series to keep it around for eight seasons. And no decision is made lightly. No, I think yeah, that's, uh, yeah. really quick to jump off that point. I think, um, yeah, what a lot of writers in the writer's room in particular wish people knew when people are kind of couch quarterbacking the uh, the, sh uh, the show that they worked on is a lot of the time because there's so many people and so many decisions run through so many people. The thing that you're suggesting has probably been thought of by someone along the way and had been dismissed for some reason, right? There was right. some larger reason, whether it was budgetary or um, practicality or an executive said no, mm -hmm. <laughs> which happens. Um, yeah. yeah, it was probably at some point thought of and, and, and had to go away for a reason. All right, it sounds good. Um, as fans, and I'm going to start with Michael on this one, um, how do you navigate the inevitable changes that happen in, in an adaptation? Oh, man. Uh, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's kind of fun because, you know, I, I know what I think the Wheel of Time is. I, I know what I think these characters look like, how they sound, whatever. Um, the opportunity to sort of get that from someone else, right, who, who does love it, um, a group of people that love it is, is amazing to me, right? I, I, I learned this a long time ago to sort of bifurcate. There's the, there's the text. The text is wonderful and is what it is, no matter what has happened. So this other thing is just this chance to see someone else loving this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so whatever changes they make, I mean, you know, that's in the service of their vision and what they're trying to accomplish and, and everything that you've just heard, because it is incredibly complicated. Um, and anytime, you know, I've had to be on a Hollywood set or, or talking to somebody on Hollywood set, you know, historical stuff. Um, yeah, there's, it's always like, well, it should be this. Well, it can't for, here's 50 reasons. Uh, and you're like, I, I just need to know it can't. Okay, what, <laughs> what do we do now, right? You know, what do we what do? We do? Um, that kind of negotiation is also sort of thrilling, right? Because you're, you're, you're doing the best you can with what you have. Um, the people that made this did an amazing job. Um, and, I, and I think... You know, we all love it, and we're very glad that it exists. Uh, yeah, it's not going to be necessarily what we would have visioned. Like, that's cool. I already have that. Now I get two things. Like, that's that's freaking awesome. And if, like, somebody makes another one, I'll have three. Like, cool. That's I really enjoy that. So I just kind of break my, my, my brain kind of in two, I guess, yeah. um, and just sort of check that, like, at the door uh, and leave it alone. Mm -hmm. um, I can't always do that with history stuff, but... With this, I can do it, I guess. Allie? Oh, yeah. How do you navigate those changes? I was, oh, how would, I was so invested in what Michael was saying that I completely forgot the question. Do you mind? <laughs> oh, yeah. So here. A lot um, of people have that problem. I know. You're just mesmerizing. I just mesmerized. You were like, yes, that's my name. Um, as a fan, how do you navigate the inevitable changes that happen in an adaptation? You know, I think knowing that nobody is on these projects they're all people and they all love the thing and nobody wants to upset anyone no one has ever been like god i hope i get mean tweets about this <laughs> you know and I mean, stuff happens for this random reason i mean i had to change a plot line and something because feet were too expensive to animate like it's the smallest thing can really can really change everything and so i think i go into it and i what I do is I go, okay, the first time I'm going to have my, what I watch, I'm just going to experience it as if I've never read these books before in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, and just like experience it as a fan. And then after that, just um, break down the why. Like, why do I, I mean, that's the fun part, right? right. Why do you think they made this change and yeah. for what purpose and what might they be screwing with me about, which I right. really love. Okay. Because I'm like, I don't actually know what might happen. And that's really exciting. And that's not just in the books. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Guy, I know that you've been a long time fan of this books. Um, how do you, going into it, like, how do you navigate the changes where, you know, there's I, one specific change, but yeah. I mean, like, uh, <laughs> but in general. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you the story about that in just a minute, but. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's actually really exciting because when I get a new script, and what's also amazing is reading 
the drafts of the scripts and the things they want to shoot and then get uh, cut or changed. <laughs> um, All the colors. You know, it brings me back uh, when I was reading the books for the first time. And, and, and so I love that. You just have to accept it's another turning of the wheel, right? And I've accepted that. And I get that same, like, part of me that's, a, you know, 18 years old or 19, whenever I found the books, and it's super exciting. And there was some, there was an actual specific event that happened um, that really helped me let go. All during season one, I had spent countless hours and I had copy and pasted every reference to Uno and Shinards in the entire series into this note file on my iPhone. And I, I, occasionally I can be disciplined. So I would read the whole thing every day for a day of shooting. And this was my way to really get in character. And then before season two, my, uh, my baby Rowan deleted it. Oh. And I was like, how am I going to play Uno without my, oh, my nose? But then I realized the wheel weaves and I had to let that go. And I still had War Pigs, which I listened to every day in the trailer, to, and which I trained to. That's the only song I listen to is War Pigs. So, uh, and that helps me get into Uno. But yeah, my son, Rowan, helped me really okay. let go. You let go of the notes, not Rowan. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. Just make, just okay. Make sure. Yeah, we don't need to talk about that. Sure. Um, all right, so let's move on to some of those changes here. Um, we aren't going to start with the big one, but let's go ahead and start with, uh, and by the big one, I mean you know, you know, the one that we have the most expertise on right now. Um, so let's start with the deadly forsaken Lanfear. Um, some of the changes for her. Natasha's is so amazing, isn't she? So good, oh my God. <laughs> okay. That's a, end of discussion. No, we got that one. Okay. Um, some of the changes were her romantic relationship with Brand, her reveal as a Forsaken, as well as seeing her, you know, murdered-ish by Moraine. Um, why do you think the changes were made with Celine and Lanfear? And let's go ahead and uh, start with, I was going to say Allie, but. I got you. What's up? Okay. Why do you think the changes were made with Celine and Lanfear? This is said with all the respect in my heart. When Celine was introduced, I was like, we found her. She's laying here. Okay, cool. On, in the books. In the books, she's like, you have to shoot an eye. And I was like, you are way too calm. You are way too calm for this situation. I need panic from you immediately. Um, so I think um, part of what um, they did that I thought was so smart was they introduced Celine before we introduced the concept of Lanfear mm -hmm. and who Lanfear is. We had heard about the Forsaken and who they were, and we'd kind of gotten a little bit of an idea of Lanfear, but they didn't really go hard into Lanfear until after she was in, uh, after she was introduced to Celine. So she, they gave us the dramatic irony that we as an audience who already know what's going to happen love. Mm -hmm. um, they gave depth to that relationship as Rand has left everything he knows behind and is now looking for a person that's going to accept him as who he is as a man, which I think is um, also an important point. Mm -hmm. But she, hiding that is kind of a, a quintessential mystery idea that having the information before we have the actual information to solve everything is how we kind of bury the lead and make for something that's a satisfying gasp moment. And I think it was really, fun to have that be more of a like mystery more of an exciting reveal and them hiding that by even just having the cold open um where it was making it so that it could have been in the past mm -hmm. but it could have also been just now i think it was a really smart use of those cold opens too yeah and a lot of the themes with land fear there are just the mystery is amped up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really, really satisfying as a viewer yeah. getting that reveal. Mm -hmm. um, as someone that knows what's going to happen, it's still so exciting. And just to see how well, when you look back on it in retrospect, she plays him. 
right. knowing. I mean, she uses all of the things that she knows about him as Luz Theron because mm-hmm. he's the same. And she calls him out on the ways he's the same as Luz and the you know foibles that he has that are similar. And you can see when you watch it back that she utilizes all of that knowledge from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really fascinating. Yeah. Guy, how about you? What do you think of Lanfear and Natasha O'Keefe? Uh, I think it is... Uh, the great performance of season two. Um, and her performance, when you have an actress like Natasha playing Lanfear, of course you're going to change some things so you can have more Lanfear. Uh, it's, I, I love those scenes. They're so great to, to watch. And uh, I'm just really so happy that, that uh, we have her in the show. Yeah. No, I love hearing that there was like a drag queen scale um for how land fear she needed to be and like no you're giving too much you're giving like a 10 on the drag queen scale we need this to be like a seven like i remember that being a behind the scenes thing so and you know one of the things that 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 they did so well with land fear and i think once you recognize what you have in in an actress there um is her arc right you know that this the big reveal at the end is there are things land fear fears Right. You know, you, you by that point have come to think, oh, she's got all the answers only to have this like curveball of, oh, no, mm-hmm. oh, no, she's worried. Like now what is and that is a terrific place to kind of leave things, especially for what happens in Knife of Dreams. chapter. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that close. Oh. Do not turn that page. Uh, there is a monster at the end of this book. <laughs> The way you were about to get side tackled by my husband from the audience. <laughs> that would have been pretty epic, honestly. Are we good? No, we're not good. Okay, there we go. Yeah, no. Um, I don't know. I think Lanfear's reveal as like what defines a monster? Mm-hmm. How is a monster defined? Because she has her own reasons for doing everything and we're learning them as we go. Right. And I feel like, I mean, a big thematic question for this season was like, who is a monster? Who can we trust? And what happens if we're wrong? Mm -hmm. Um, And are we ourselves a monster somehow? Um, And I think that having Lanfear be this sort of trusted person from the beginning is showcasing just how dire those consequences are. If we get, you know, charmed by the stranger who tells us the Trollocs are just fun to pet. Right, right, right. Yeah, they're just cute. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see here. We're moving on time with this, like. Shocking. I mean, on a panel with me and uh, Allie, I assume that there would be a lot, a lot, a lot of extra talking. <laughs> so I'm surprised that we're on time. Um, so let's go ahead and talk now about someone who died a little bit prematurely. Um, <laughs> And it proved, I know a lot of, I've heard a lot of people saying that they were really mad after episode three. Um, because you are a fan favorite character. That's such a compliment to you too. <laughs> and as someone who made us, made us laugh, um, what was it like? Like, just how did Uno's death impact you? <laughs> <laughs> Got how much time you. do we have? Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, well, there's a, a long story. I'll try to make it short. And it's it's not totally my story to tell. It's also Rafe's. Um, you know, obviously, as a fan of the books, when I got cast as Uno, I thought, oh, God, if I don't fuck this up, like, I have a job for a long time. <laughs> um, but in thinking of adaptations and things you have to do, one of the challenges with The Wheel of Time, the book series, are the stakes at the beginning because none of the major characters die. And the show, as a TV show, needed that Sean Bean moment. And it also had to, you had to have it to show how powerful the Sean Chan are, what a threat they are. And I was working on another show called Hannah and this the stunt master, Jan, who's amazing, who's this, I mean, he's, unbelievable he was the double for captain america and thor and all the chrises and everything and this guy literally <laughs> is a superhero and he came up to me and he's like what the you fucking killing the, your head and i was like what and this is months before 
So I, I called up Rafe. Okay, this is my version of the story only. Uh, Noted for posterity. Um, and then Rafe and I had dinner and he was like, you're not dead. It's not been decided. Yes, we have to kill someone. We don't want it to be you, but we're a little stuck because it has to be someone that the audience has had a connection with in some ways because it has to happen. And they went through, it wasn't decided. And, you know, Rafe, I, I, I love Rafe. I think what he balances is extraordinary. And he said, I really don't want it to be you, but there are some executives and other people who think it has to be someone like you. And I said, don't kill me, Rafe. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't kill me. And he goes, we, we, we don't want to, we got to keep thinking about it. And so they went, I know they went back and forth. And at one point it was, you know, we'd lost Ummer, and then Ummer was replaced by Greg. Both of them were amazing. And it was really fantastic to have two Ingtars. Oh, I guess we don't call Ummer Ingtar anymore. But um, they thought about that, but they knew that that storyline is super important. And apparently the deleted scenes exist somewhere of Ingtar. Um, it was going to be Masima at one point. Um, you know, I, but there was just all kinds of things. And for whatever reason, um, I was doing a costume fitting and one of the costume assistants said, oh, your poor head. And I was... <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, so I, I, I texted Rave and I was like, hey, it's cool, man. I, I know and don't get mad that it, they didn't know I didn't know. And so Rafe called me in and he said, all right, well, we need to have a talk. And, and uh, I said, all right. All right, let me tell you why this is a mistake. <laughs> and uh, I gave all my reasons, which I thought were excellent reasons, by the way. Um, and the, the biggest reason, I, I said it was a short story. It's, a, it's an important story for me. But in The Great Hunt, you know, Rand spends the whole time thinking Uno is upset with him and hates him because Uno is just looking at him. And then at the end of The Great Hunt, Uno has this great little speech about the dragon breaking all bonds. And Uno swears loyalty. And Uno is the first person in the books, the first normal person, uh, who swears to Rand, to follow Rand. And I think it was super important and intentional on Robert Jordan's part that someone like Uno recognize that in Rand. And that if someone like Uno would follow Rand, then there might be a chance at the last battle. So this was all part of my pitch, you know. <laughs> right. um, but anyways, I, I said to Rafe, uh, I said, all right, well, I've got an idea for you. If you're gonna kill me, let me come back as a hero of the horn. And he looked at me and he goes, huh. He said, I'll never forget it. He looked at me and he said, I like that idea, I really like it. We're not gonna do it, but I really like it. And we hadn't started shooting yet. So in my mind, I played all of season two like I knew I was a hero of the horn and coming back. And I wasn't sure, so if you go back and watch it, you probably can't see it, but I wasn't sure if Rand was gonna do it and I was putting all my hopes and dreams on Perrin. And I was hoping that, you know, this one, because I, I wanted to mirror the Perrin relationship that Uno has with Rand in The Great Hunt. So I put it on Marcus, and Marcus is such a great guy. It's so fun to, to be with him. And, and so the whole time, I just thought, I'm a hero of the horn. I'm coming back. So even when we shot, of course, this wasn't happening. I was dead. And so then when we shot uh, that scene with where my fucking wife kills me, you know, um, in my mind, I was like, it's OK. I'm going to take that horn because I needed to show, so this is all in my mind, right? So there's an outtake, which I was hoping they were gonna put in the show that when I'm dragged away by the Sean Chan, I turn to Marcus and I say, fight. And I was hoping in my mind that killing, that me taking that death would spur Perrin to take up the ax uh, or the hammer. Um, but to really propel him and help him. So this is all going through my mind. And I'm just like, I'm going to project this so I come back as a hero of the horn, even if it doesn't happen. But that was it. The, the gig was over. And then months later, we finished shooting in uh, October. 
in January around 10 o'clock at night, Rafe sent me a WhatsApp and he said, can I call you? And I was like, <gasps> yes, you can call me. <laughs> and he said, so we, we've consulted with the estate. We have the approval of the state and everyone thinks, everyone's very excited for you to come back as a hero of the horn. And I was like, <laughs> uh, just planting that one little seed. Yeah. And the other funny thing is a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I had the, the great privilege of meeting Brandon Sanderson for the first time. And we were talking about it. And he told me he's, he's ended every email with hashtag save Uno. So <laughs> I think between Brandon and myself, and I also know, I know that Rafe didn't want to do it. Um, but I think now we have the best of both worlds. We have the best of the adaptation and Uno's still going to be there for the last battle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, Allie and Michael, I don't want to make you guys the bad guys, but I do want to talk a little bit about why Uno was the best choice. Okay, I do have to um, to, as a uh, character. <laughs> so, um, yeah, n navigate that. Here's the thing. <laughs> It's very difficult to kill off an actor in your projects because when you are writing it as like a novelist, right, there's no one whose job depends on you keeping them alive. Um, so, you know, you don't have to tell anybody, oh, you need to now look for another job. So that's a difficult thing to, to talk about. But um, I think in terms of not just what it does to the stakes for new new watchers what it does to the stakes for the old watchers is also equally important right we think we know where the story is going and uh we might be getting really comfortable with that uh and i think that in order to raise the stakes for us as people who are fans already killing off a character that is much beloved like uno and much beloved like guy roberts um is the correct choice in terms of giving us that feeling of hold on to your butts. We're not necessarily supposed to be comfortable. You shouldn't necessarily sit back on the couch and relax and watch this show. Um, so I think in terms of that, that is, um, I think, the right call. Um, I also think, though, that bringing you back was the right call because I feel like you touched on this a little bit, but Perrin's relationship to violence is so in question throughout the two seasons. And getting to see somebody who... Um, you know, embraces, not embraces violence, but embraces the occasional necessity for violence um, and finds that line um, between going so far into uh, liking the ax that we need to throw the ax away, which we see in so many characters. And then the tinker, just sit back and take it when life hands you lemons, eat lemons. Um, I think for you, having that heroic moment at the end where you refuse to allow the Sean Chan to take those women and showcase just how frightening it is to be that person that stands up in the face of what's wrong um, but and takes the violent consequences that come from that, but in a way where you went out swinging, I think is important to show Perrin in that moment. So I do actually think that that scene is going to have lasting ramifications if, if I think that they're doing what they're doing thematically, which who knows? Well, I'm not in that room. I, and I'll <laughs> add to what, what I loved is, you know, because at first I thought, why, why do I have a shield? And then when I come back and give Perrin the shield to protect, I thought it was totally in line. And then I get to pull the two swords out, little Easter egg for something in the future. Yeah. So I, I think giving Perrin that shield and for Perrin's journey is super important as well. Getting to see that, you know, violence with reason is sometimes necessary when we are doing it in defense of the innocent and that you as a character were rewarded, not necessarily that that was what made you ascend, but that you as a character exemplify all of that. And then we get to see you in this heroic fashion, I think was really important, important for parents development. And I'm also just glad we get to see you more. Yeah, me yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. I know one of the comments that I heard was um, about like, well, he could have just bowed. And I no. think, no. I think I, I heard that yesterday never. and I just wanted to clear the air and just be like, look, I don't think he could have bowed because that would have like compromised all of his values. Yeah, Massimo so. would bow, Inktar would bow, Una would never bow. Right. 
And, and that's why you're a hero of the horn. That's why I had to be Uno in that moment, in that particular instance. Okay. Do we have any other uh, comments about You're Uno? just too brave. <laughs> well, I, I just would say I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it is this, and the Rafe was right. You have to off somebody, right? Um, there's uh, the, in the movie Serenity. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, it came out a while ago. The Sixth Sense. Bruce Willis is dead. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Rosebud. Rosebud. It was a sled. All right. Um, so in Hamlet, anyway, um, you can hear about that from him. Um, you know that that there's there is that in the climax. You know we lose a we lose a character utterly unexpectedly, right? If you've seen the movie, I mean, there's ju it is just shocking. I remember watching in the theaters and just being like, uh -uh, and thinking nobody's safe, right? In this moment now, nobody is safe. This is not oh, everybody can come out roses in the end. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, and as a writer, you sometimes love your characters and you have to do that, yeah. right? Because the, those are the stakes, right? I mean, I've had bad reviews of my novels for like, oh, you killed off this character I really liked. Good. Like, I'm sad that you're sad, but I'm glad that they meant something to you. And that's kind of why I had to do it because you have to know that there's stakes in this world. And that scene was just so perfectly planted for doing that and establishing that over everything for the rest of the season, right? We now know things might not be okay. They might not be okay for a queen. They might, like, it just constantly hanging over everything. So, you know, good job taking one for the team. Yeah. Yeah. The reconstructive surgery is slipping. <laughs> also, there are like 11,000 characters in this in these novels. We can't hire 11,000 actors. <laughs> some people have got to go. Like, some people have got to die. We're glad it wasn't necessarily you permanently, but some people do need yeah. to go maybe prematurely. Yeah. Just no. for I, cost. <laughs> I think it's like 2,700 something, something. It's too many. Yeah, that's a lot of it's people. too many. Um, yeah, so I do also want to go ahead and move on to talk about a certain IEL that was replaced. Um, because I know several people were not, um, again, this is a <laughs> fan favorite character. Um, we don't have it, but we don't have that character right now. Um, we do get Avienda in the cage instead of Gull. So what do we think about why the change was made? Streamlining. I mean, it's my was my assumption at the time. This is streamlining. You, you, and this is what we talked about early on, right? You can't, you can't run every storyline in these books, like not in a hundred episodes a season for a hundred. Like, there's there's too much, and there's so many characters. And then of course you amplify that times, you know, what's in the notes and everything. I mean, it's, it's too big, so you have to figure out ways to track things crunch it down. This is going to have to be introduced earlier. This person is going to have to play the role of three people because we can't, and well, we also can't afford probably to hire that many people. Uh, so we need to like get that stuff shrunk down. And those, those questions are constantly being faced in any adaptation. Um, and I think they did, a, I think a really good job on this one because now we have her sooner and yeah, it means we lost something, but like we gained something. So mm -hmm. I liked it. I would just say that fight, right? <laughs> yeah, that the fight, fight was pretty phenomenal. And uh, a lot of that fight was Alice, the stunt woman Alice, who was doubling for Iowa, and Alice is just a fucking ninja. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, Avienda has a lot more importance to the story now, whereas Gaul can come up a little bit later and still be just about as impactful. Yeah, and I think um, what I kind of like in terms of just a framing to make sure that Rand is present in every plot line. We have each of um, Rand's childhood friends mm -hmm. having some sort of relationship with one of the women that he ultimately falls in love with before we ever know that they're connected. A uh, spoiler. I, we said 11, right? We said book 11. Okay. We said book 11. All right. Sorry. Did I, okay. But anyway, if, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. Uh, but we have this ability to have this like nice framing device where, you know, Egwene and Nynaeve are hanging out with Elaine and getting to know Elaine as her own independent person prior mm -hmm. to Rand falling in love with her. We get Matt and Min, which I'm loving their dynamic together. Um, I never would have envisioned them hanging out together, but it all makes so much perfect sense. Um, and that both of them are dealing with their own struggles about their worthiness mm -hmm. and whether they are bad people um, while, you know, Egwene, Elaine, and Nynaeve are working on their dynamic because Egwene and Nynaeve are now for the first time at odds and Nynaeve is the star and Egwene is tired of being number two. Um, and in comes this person to kind of mix that up a little bit. And then we also have Perrin and his relationship to violence meeting the person that Rand falls in love with who the most is connected to a philosophy surrounding violence. So I think that's a really smart choice um, and is a good kind of economy of storytelling while also making sure that Rand, you know, when people complain that Rand is not present in the show, he's in every single plot line. Right. I remember going through the outlines for the shows and being like, it all relates to Rand and the A plot yeah. pretty much. It all comes back to him. I wonder why. I wonder. <laughs> Sorry, that's not. No, yeah, you're not there yet. Um... <laughs> My father-in-law was reading the next book, that book 12, in front of me the other day and, like, giggling to himself and, like, gasping. It was the meanest thing he's ever done to me. In his life. Oh, my. I cannot. I, uh, I, I, I yelled at him. <laughs> actual statement? Okay, I was wow. like, would you care to share something with the class? Oh, my God. No. Anyway. No, no, no. Um... Yeah, I think it also allows for the women in um, Rand's life to be introduced in separate contexts from their relationship to Rand, because yeah. so often they are just tied to Rand and they don't have to be because they are badass women on their own. So, um, also we got Bane and Chiad, which wouldn't have been possible at all. But... Yeah, and I feel like because Perrin's relationship to violence is still ongoing, you know, we haven't solved that at all. Um, having a friend who, you know, can guide him through Giotto at risk of spoilering again, um, Giotto and, you know, that kind of middle ground that Perrin mm -hmm. is looking for. I think, I think there's a place for Gaul on the show for sure. I don't necessarily know, obviously a hundred percent, but I think there's a place for him. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the, Anything else on, do we have anything else on Gaul, Gaul Vienda? I don't like oh. that. I don't think I like that. Just how great was Ayula? <laughs> Ayula was so amazing. The, the, all of it was pretty phenomenal. It was great to see the Ayula culture on the screen a little bit because we didn't really, just a little bit. Um, so one of the biggest changes from the books this season has been with Moraine and Lan. Um, Moraine doesn't have a lot of screen time in The Great Hunt, but she is crucial to the plot of season two. Um, one of the other big changes was Rand healing Moraine or stilling, you know, using these words loosely. Oh. Using these words loosely. Um, question for panelists. I mean, aside from the whole, hey, you have Rosman Pike, you need to use Rosman Pike, which is an incredibly valid statement. Like, <laughs> I mean, incredibly valid. I can't overstate the validity of that. Um, but what are the reasons for having Moraine take a bigger role in season two? Wait here for that one. I mean, you have Rosamund Pike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what? I was like, and it's still going to get brought you up. Know, and I, I'll tell you something. The way Rosamund, uh, she's absolutely phenomenal on on set and she is Moraine for the whole show for all of us and she leads by example and I, I just want to tell a little Rosamond story very quickly um, and I you know I shared this when this happened I, I talked to her about it because I was so blown away in season one uh, on my first or second day um, Thomas Agamar had a very long speech when Rosamond and you know, the kids and everyone come to Shinar there. And of course, the way it is on TV, you know, they shoot Rosamond first. And then the camera's off her for the rest of the day. And sometimes a number one on a call sheet will just leave. But 
And we spent hours on the turnaround with Thomas doing it from all kinds of angles. And every single take, she gave a hundred percent performance and the performance grew and grew and grew. And I have never seen a number one on a call sheet do that. And I couldn't believe it. It was the greatest lesson in leadership I've ever seen because she cared about Thomas and his performance. And I told her, I, I just said, that was the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. And the rest of it's her story to tell, but she says something happened to her when she was younger where that didn't happen. And she vowed she would never do it. And she set such a great example on that set that, I mean, that's the kind of thing though, it, it comes from the top down, you know, Rafe is, is so generous and, and there's so much caring on that set. Um, so that's the kind of thing. But I will say very briefly, uh, I thought it was great. Yeah, I, I love the because it's another turning of the wheel. You know, I watch the episodes because I don't see everything in advance. I watch the episodes just like you and I'm a fan. And those, you know, those scenes, I, I just thought they're terrific. And then uh, I, I'm a big fan of the change. And I think it's okay to, to make a change like that if you have Daniel and Rosamund. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not trying to say that wasn't like, you know, a great reason. I'm just saying like she adds a lot to the story and having her be our kind of like she was in season one with our leader. She's still leading things. She's just leading them from, you know, behind the scenes a little bit more this season. Um, so having that continuum between season one and season two is really, really nice. I, oh, no, you go, please. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, I also think that um, if we're talking about season two, you know, kind of it, with traditional season structure, that's going to be your obstacle season. So that's going to be where the stakes start to ratchet up in intensity. And when we're thinking about, you know, what if we're wrong? What if we're making the wrong choices? Um, what if we're trusting the wrong people? Having the person that we have seen in season one as the most capable person and the person that we're like, oh yeah, she's got it all together, suddenly on the back foot and suddenly realizing that the Forsaken know a lot more than she does, even though she's been preparing for this for 20 odd years, um, that she's you know, thousands of years behind us seeing that again, when we're talking about raising the stakes, raises the stakes enormously. Um, in addition to that, getting to spend that much time with Lan and Moraine and their relationship and how important they are to each other, um, because certainly they are important to each other, uh, sets us up for a lot of heartbreak down the road and understanding a lot of what Lan endures down the road. Um, so, you know, in addition to, being a necessary plot line for practicality reasons and because Rosamund Pike is amazing and we all want to see her, we are also setting up the inevitable. I mean, the doorway is coming because we've seen it with all of Moraine's additional interactions with Lanfear. What? what doorway? What are you talking about? What doorway? About? I tried to be as vague as possible. I'm sorry, that was so loud. I tried to be as vague as possible. But the doorway is coming and I think that plot line and giving us um, that deep look inside the relationship, but also seeing both of them on the back foot, both gives the Forsaken more power and makes us more concerned that this victory might not be possible after all. And we also get to see um, these people interact uh, as we're heading toward that inevitable conclusion, probably not conclusion, to that story. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, they, I mean, you have a Gandalf problem, right? Yeah. I mean, Moraine has this capability, and if you don't sort of show a way of getting that off the board, mm -hmm. um, then it sort of prevents you from having a lot of opportunities as a writer. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I thought this was a terrific way of doing it. And you know, you know, uh, Robert Jordan did it himself later on um, in a different way. Uh, this was good. Bring it, bring it forward. Um, you know, again, it's it's establishing everything as a threat, and nothing is for sure. It's all contingent. And that's a good thing. It also shows us that the Forsaken have knowledge and technology that we they can only guess at. They don't they don't have any knowledge of how they were able to tie off waves. That's a new thing for them. Um, and having that on screen example of just how much how ahead the Forsaken are when it comes to you know what they know versus what Moraine is kind of guessing at because it's thousands of years of old prophecy. It's like trying to you know, decipher meaning from the, the the Odyssey, you know, and go like, oh, this is how it's supposed to happen. I mean, it's 
it's been corrupted over just the passage of time versus them who are like, we were there, we lived it. Next. Right. So I think that was a good opportunity. Yeah, and also like um, ups the stakes so much. It's just, it makes me really, really happy when I'm like, I legitimately don't know who's safe. Yeah. It's my favorite. They might be screwed. <laughs> Okay, well, that's a little far, but... Um, <laughs> nah, they'll, they'll figure it out. They'll be fine. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Spoilers, um, they don't win the last battle. <laughs> yeah, right? Spoilers. What if? Oops. <laughs> what if I'm up here like, they'll be fine, and they're not? Yeah. I don't know. That is all I had for, like, the changes that we want to talk about. Uh, I was thinking we could take some audience questions. Anyone have anyone else, anything they would like to say before we go to that? Cool. All right. I see a hand right there. I think it's definitely a wheel of time. When I read the scripts, even though things change, I feel like that is Rand, that is Perrin, that's Egwene, that's Nynaeve. I feel like the core of the character, now this is just my opinion, obviously I'm a fan, uh, and I support the show 100%, but I feel when I read those scripts, these are the characters from the book just in another turning. And I think there is literally no other way. I, I, I mean, as you said, you can't have 100 seasons of 100 episodes. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that it, whether it's loyal or whatever those are the characters that i know or my version of the characters in the book so i think they have they have not uh gone over the line and uh, i'm you know i have as much excitement reading the script or seeing an episode as i did when i would go to the bookstore and see the the new book out and bought it mm -hmm. i'm biased though but I'm also right. <laughs> I was going to say, rightly so. All right. Um, Aaron. Uh, so, some of the discourse this past season was talking about my name and my name a lot and how they weren't as powerful as they come across in the Great Hunt. I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the reasons that my name and Rand have less screen time and have us like, come into their own power. Uh, to some degree, you, you, at least to my mind, if I was in that writer's room, I mean, and look, nobody's ever asked me anything about it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, you, you have to have a pacing here, right? You know, you, you can't sort of introduce a new Gandalf problem, as it were, uh, in season two of this many seasons. So we're, we're going to have to pace those kind of things out a little bit just on a initial look at it, right? You know, you, you have to know that's what you're going to have to do. And I, and I think what they're doing in setting up characters beyond, I'm trying to think how to say this, beyond their power capabilities, um, these are characters, they're, they're, they're human beings. Um, and that that's the reason we care for them. We don't, we don't care for them because, um, oh, that one can do this cool fireball thing. Um, we care about them because we love that character. Oh, and also there's a fireball thing, right? And and they're trying, at least I think, again, I'm, I'm not there. Um, uh, they're trying to sort of set that up as the way this works because that's how you get a loyal following is we fall in love with the characters. And I think most people who are, who are giving them it a chance at all are falling in love with these characters. And much of that, of course, is a, a testament to the acting as well, that you have such a great cast. I mean, nobody in the cast... Is, has blown it. I mean, I don't think they're all like, God dang it. Well done. Like, yeah, well all... done. Well done. Well done. They're amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think also you'll, you'll correct me if I'm incorrect about this, but when Robert Jordan was writing the series, he thought it was going to be much shorter than it ended up being correct. Yes. So I think he, we see a lot over the course of the series that he accelerates their power and character development and then naturally realizing that it's going to be a lot longer than he thought has to make them backslide a little bit. And we see that happen a few times over the course of the series um, in a couple different arcs. Oh, thank you. I got a ribbon. 
It says, it might turn out to be a trilogy. Yes. <laughs> Mike, Queen, exactly. Mike. Thank you, Michael. He thought it would be three books. We have the foresight and advantage of knowing that it's actually, what, 14 books? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I so knew, I knew you were going to say that, and so we had these made. You did that just for me. Just for you. I knew that. I felt that. I really oh. did. I'm special. No. Um, so special. So, so he might. thought it was going to be a trilogy. So, of course, he accelerated their power abilities in book two because he thought that was the penultimate book. Um, versus we know that season two is not, hopefully, the penultimate season. But... Um, yeah, so we've got to have them, and it's the obstacle season, so we have to show them having obstacles. We have to give Nynaeve's block weight and show the consequences of not being able to act when you're needed. We have to show Rand learning, because if he goes from zero to nuclear weapon, that does not... Uh, that makes us very confident that he's going to be able to defeat these forsaken easy-peasy lemon squeezy. Um, we don't want to feel that way as an audience. We never want to feel like we know how this is going to go and that it's all going to be fine because if we think that everything's going to be fine, we're, there's no reason to keep watching. So we have to have them a little bit on the back foot um, and show, the, show them learning and growing because that gives them a place to go. If you start an improv scene at a 10, right, there's nowhere to go, the scene dies. Similar concept in television. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfectly said. Thank you so much for that, guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That one was bad. Um, let's see here. Uh, tiara. Uh, I'm sorry. The tiara in the front row right here. <laughs> well, um, first of all, Dono is the real deal, mm -hmm. and he's an incredible man. I I'll tell you, when we were filming the horn scene, you know, the tears, the, the actor preparation he was doing, it was extraordinary because he understood how important that moment is for Matt. And I think we're incredibly lucky to have him. Stuff happens uh, for all kinds of various reasons. Um, you know, sometimes an actor is just not available because maybe they weren't signed to an exclusive contract and they had to take another job, which, which is what happened with Ummer when he got the lead in Willow. You know, so things happen and uh, you roll with it and the wheel weaves and takes care of things and it all works out in the end. Yeah, that was, I mean, whatever else was happening, I can't imagine the challenge of that from a writer's position. Like we have one plan. No, we don't. We don't. We have to, and, and midstream to try and make something that's going to look right, that's going to resolve things right. Um, I mean, you know, the same thing with, with COVID, right? Having to, to shoot through those conditions, sure. which were not planned, um, and we have a plan, and we have to now, on the fly, kind of make a new plan. Uh, it, it's it's suboptimal. Um, it's not the ideal that anybody wanted, but you do the best you can. And given the conditions, they did the best they could, and it's, I think, really amazing. And, um, and you know, again, as you are saying, you, know, you, sort of, you go from like, well, why did they do that? Why did they, you know, and you're like, oh, nice. So, I mean, I, at least for me, I'm always watching it like, you know, nice. I see what you did there. Like, there was your problem. Nice solution. Like, it's kind of, it's kind of a puzzle in that regard. And it's good. Yeah. I mean, I think um, Rafe and Co., they understand the emotional beats of each character's storyline. And those are the things that are the most important is what are the emotional beats that these people need to hit? Um, Matt Cawthon's journey uh, largely revolves around that saying over and over again, I'm no hero, right? So we present him, they presented him in a situation where we see why he would feel that way. Um, and then as they continue on their journey, they know that the important emotional beats that he needs to hit and those important scenes that he needs to have, as long as they're paying attention to what he needs to be doing emotionally, they will find their way back to that track. And I think that they are. 
I mean, we got the horn. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I think, um, I think, yeah, paying attention to those emotional beats and building those out makes it so that they can get their way back and make us feel like they've earned their way back, if that makes sense. All right. Um, yes. Yes. You. Yes. One of the things that I'm struggling with is some of the changes in the story and the adaptation kind of take away opportunities from some of the characters. You know, for example, it was the Grange finale, not Rand's finale, just as an example. Mm -hmm. But some of the reasons we love the characters is because of the experiences they go through that make them who they are. And if you take away some of those experiences, do we just hope that later on they have an experience that helps make them who they are, or are they not who they are anymore? in this adaptation compared to who they were in the books because they don't have those experiences. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I guess I were to rephrase the question or phrase it um, for the audience listening. Um, I don't know. I don't really know how to describe that as a question. I think it's maybe uh, surrounding what what we lose. What we lose. What we changes. lose in terms of character development by okay. taking certain moments and giving them to other characters. Yeah. Does yeah. that does that feel accurate? Okay. Yeah. Um, you can start. <laughs> okay. Um, I think similarly, it's about you know they understand the trajectory of these characters and where they need to go. All of those decisions were talked about, I think, very much at length. I mean, if I recall correctly from an interview with Rafe, he has Sarah do a basically report on what if they make a change, how that will impact every plot line going forward. And they think about all of that before they make that decision. So I think that they're keeping in mind what uh, those important integral emotional growth moments are, whether they'll be exactly the same or whether they feel like um, they need to do them later so that we have a longer arc for, for certain things, they, they probably have thought about a lot. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of making sure that they end up being the person that they are, they're definitely making sure that that's a priority. But also, listen, you know, Egwene's going to be different to you than Egwene is to me. Mm -hmm. We're all going to respond to these characters in individual ways. And so I think we have to have a little grace about when you're trying to do something, accomplishing something big to reach a wide audience, because everyone on the show loves Wheel of Time and they want the world to love Wheel of Time. Just there's, there's sometimes changes have to be made in support of the ensemble and in support of of building characters so uh you know i i think that for me uh i i love the the conclusion of season two and uh you just you, when you guys see season three <laughs> okay okay i feel like i'm listening to my father-in-law read the book <laughs> All right, yeah, we might have time for one more quick question. Uh, I'll, I'll Gus. For, for each of you, is there a, a change that made you most, like, oh, my God, I can't believe they did that in a positive or negative way that stands out to you the first time you watched it? <laughs> I mean, for me, really quickly, it was that we don't have to deal with reincarnation again and again and again, it looks like. That made me really personally happy. Is yours the opposite of that? Uh, That's not how you remove a an arrow from a wound. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, that won't work to hide an arm. I, I, I loved everything except things that I was just like, I, you got my email, don't you? Like, like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this just doesn't work in a in like a real just a realism kind of thing. But I understand entirely. Like, I have issues. <laughs> right, like I like I know that, and I know that ninety nine percent or whatever the audience doesn't know. Right, so when I'm there, like just twitching, you know, um, <laughs> the historian in me, I you know I have to like tell him to shut up and go away. Uh, so those those are the, the things. Like, I, I'm not trying to like spoil the part. I I love the show, and I watch the show religiously. I love it, love it, love it. 
Um, but yeah, those are the things that most like everything else. I'm just, Oh my God, this is incredible. Um, yeah. Did you mean, Oh my God, positive or Oh my God. He said positive positive or negative. negative. So I thought I'd throw out a, you know, (laughs) <laughs> just rain on my parade about um, no reincarnation in terms of positive um guy coming back um i just as a background i've known guy for a long time um we worked together for a summer in prague which was amazing and um so i know how much you love the wheel of time. You got me really good because I messaged him all these condolences and he played it up really hard. <laughs> like really, because he can't say anything to me, even though we, we know each other outside of everything. And um, so, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, they would get leaked that he was on the show and I messaged him and said, congrats on being on the show. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. laid it on so thick. That I was so convinced that you were gone. And so then when he came back, Gus and I just started screaming. We had to like stop for a minute and collect ourselves. So that was a highlight for me personally. Yeah, I I mean, I, I did enjoy watching some of the reactions to coming back as the hero. That was really fun. Um, you know, there was this uh, terrific actor that died in episode 203, and that change had a big effect on me. Right. Um, <laughs> But I, I mean, I love everything with Ferris Ferris and mm. Natasha. And then when McGideon comes in at the end, I'm just like, yes. oh, so good. Yeah. I was so excited because I have been a McGideon stand from the beginning. I've been a McGideon truther from the beginning. And I have said that goth girls are hot and yet she still doesn't do well in the Grinwell Cup. And it makes me furious. And so then... <laughs> She comes out in all of her glory, like I knew she would. And then and then somebody tweeted, and I can't remember who it was, but they said, finally, people are standing Maggetti. And I'm like, finally, I've been standing here this whole time for years. I've been a truth. So I'm, I, that was also one for me. That, yeah. Ditto. Ditto. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for showing up to the wheel. Great. Yeah. The adaptation panel here for season two. Thank you so much to our guests an honor having you guys up here uh and yeah we will be uh moving on to the next panels around four o'clock so enjoy your break yeah i I feel bad you always so many questions yeah